Like it or not, street art is everywhere in Chicago. Some find it beautiful, some think it's a nuisance. Some of it is commissioned, most of it illegal. One thing is for certain, we are in a graffiti renaissance, and who better to help us navigate that renaissance than the man who has plugged in himself, author and poet Kevin Koval. Kevin, thank you so much for having me out here today. Welcome to the Crawford Steel Plant, which is one of the only permissive-based graffiti centers in the city, maybe the world, maybe the country for sure. All of what you see, all of what we're seeing now is permissive. It's not necessarily legal. It's not necessarily illegal. It's writers and graffiti artists from really all over the country who come and make this a Destination. Why do you think Chicago has this love-hate relationship with graffiti? Because it's not going anywhere. I think people misunderstand it, and so I think that's part of it. In Chicago especially, we think it's associated with gang culture and gang violence, and I think that there's a power in street organizations and a beauty in gang graffiti, but what we see now is just essentially young people from working class communities, communities of color who are going to any means necessary to express themselves in a school system that is actively cutting arts programming in a country that doesn't necessarily value those contributions. Young people have innovated a form and a culture that's very vibrant and so we just have to get hip to what it is. In this special you're going to meet so many talented street artists from Chicago. As a female in a male dominated industry, street artist Sam Kirk is finding ways to push those boundaries in more ways than one. It's vibrant, it's whimsical, it's very expressive, it's colorful, very energetic. <laughs> like looking at it to see. It's joyful, it's relatable, relevant. I started to get involved in mural work mostly because I felt like there were issues that needed to be addressed and I thought public art was a great way to start that conversation. My name is Sam Kirk. I'm a multidisciplinary artist based in Chicago. My work is a celebration of culture and identity, and it's really about inspiring pride and recognition for underrepresented communities. I was born and raised on the South Side. I grew up in a mixed family, and I'm queer. My own personal life experience has been witnessing a lot of discrimination, and in that, I always wanted to use my work to share the voices of people that were either similar to me or had struggles that were different than mine. Painting murals allowed me to do that. In my pieces for figures, I use a palette that includes multiple skin tones in each person. And I do that so that we represent multiple cultures. I'm part of the LGBTQ community and I know what it's like to not have representation. We're only allowed to sh have that representation in spaces that are designated for us. I don't want to be told I can only create artwork about the LGBT community in Boys Town or in neighborhoods that are designated for us to exist. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I've never lived in Boys Town. So why can't I have something in my community that represents other people like me? I did my first international mural last year in Morocco. I was the first woman to be included in their annual street art festival, and I painted that with my partner, my wife. <laughs> As a queer couple, it's illegal to be queer in Morocco, and to do that together was just an experience in itself. You know, to be women painting on, on that scale with a large group of men was an experience, and then also to do it and to have to hide our identities it was just something to learn from. The majority of my work, whether it's illustrations or paintings or murals, ties to different issues or different things that are happening in our communities and in our city. One of the murals that I created was about women in trades. They're often not represented. So I use that opportunity to highlight women who work in trade industries. Being a woman in a male-dominated industry definitely has its challenges. I've been doing this now for nine years, and I've still been asked, like, oh, when's the artist showing up? As if I'm not the artist doing the work. We could be halfway through it or almost finished with it, and there's still men asking us, 
if we need help getting on the scaffold or operating a scissor lift. Because of those challenges, I also make it a point if I need assistance in completing some of these murals just because they're very large, I only hire women because I feel like the only way that's going to change that perspective and that mentality is for people to see more women out there doing this work. Kevin, why is it so important to use art as a way to talk about social changes and spark dialogue? Well, graffiti is an interruption of the public space. And I think what is normal, what is monotonous, is also we can contest maybe how we operate in public space. And graffiti is at one platform operating is just something that's beautiful. And then in another, it's also making you understand where are people coming from in the city that often will not visibly see them. We don't really often think about communities of color, working class communities, and so graffiti is an interruption. Like, no, 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 we're here, regardless if you see us or, or, or not. Right, and as you just saw, Sam works legally. But coming up next, you're gonna meet an artist who does not. We'll tell you his story next. And later, meet the man changing the South Side, one wall at a time. We've shown you how artists in the city work legally and with permission. Well, this next artist does not and wouldn't reveal his identity. Wheat pasting, graffiti, stickers is illegal, first and foremost. Street art is vandalism. We like to criminalize things that make us uncomfortable. My art is simple. My art is for everyone. It's sarcastic, comforting, whimsical. It's silly, it's funny. It could be about deep things or could be about surface things. My name is Penny Pinch and I'm a street artist from Chicago. I use entirely free, found, traded materials. The name Penny Pinch came from the idea that I've never spent any money on art supplies and that capitalism is rough. The reason I keep my identity private is because this isn't who I am. This is just one of the things that I do, and it's not even my job, it's just a hobby. It's been helpful for me just to keep those things separate. I get art supplies from the dumpster, from Craigslist, Freecycle, from friends. And what's crazy is once you let it be known that you're looking for free materials, everybody's got paint in their basement. People throw away so much stuff. We have a huge problem with waste. Nobody really wants to recycle. And so it's, it's been really easy for me to find free materials. People have asked me, hey, can you make me a, a yellow painting? And I have to be like, no, because I don't have yellow paint. Or I want something that's 24 by 24. It's like, no, because I can't find that exact size. a guy in like a buffalo costume. That's kind of my signature character. Usually he has like a speech bubble or a sign that he's holding and saying something kind of snarky and sarcastic. Usually something that if you just read it, it's funny, but if you want to think about it, it could be talking about something deeper. I started doing wheat pasting because you could do a lot of the work beforehand and then actually putting it up on the street is really quick and really easy. It only takes a few seconds. When I'm putting up a poster on an abandoned building or on a piece of wood, it's not causing any damage and it's not hurting anyone. It's just a way for me to interact with my city. The very first conversation I had with Penny Finch was about making his work accessible to the masses. At the very beginning, he was resistant to even sell his work. He was accustomed to bartering and trading and gifting it to people who reacted to it in a positive light. His price points are extremely, uh, extremely accessible. I'm in the position where I'm able to sell art for an affordable price. That's been something that's really important to me. I don't have a specific end goal in mind when I put art out on the street. Once you put it out in the street, it doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to the people and the city and the street. And then 
whatever happens to it happens to it or however it gets interpreted is how it gets interpreted and that's a really interesting aspect of street art is that once it's out there it's not about the artist anymore. Our city keeps taking funding away from art programs, especially in CPS. Art is important for the young people because it teaches you how to interact with your world in a healthy way and interact with the things you're feeling and the things that are going on in your life. People are meant to create. That's what we were made to do. It teaches young people the skills to cope with things that are going on. How do we get young people to experience art? And one of the ways is to take that to the street with preferably legal pieces. If people have walls, they should have art on them. But you know, if, if a building is abandoned and, and burned out and has wood over the windows, I'm gonna put posters there. Kevin, Penny Pinch touched on this in the piece, but what is wheat pasting? It's a pretty old form of just hanging up political ads or campaign posters, and then street artists have used it. It's just, you know, like a simple mixture of flour and different things. Everyone has their own ingredients to put up essentially posters in mass on the street. Is this something common for artists who want to hide their identity? Well, wheat pasting is one technique to apply street art, and then I know Penny Pinch in the piece didn't want his face shown, and part of it is that they want to remain anonymous because what they're doing, we have to remember, is also illegal because the city still continues to criminalize this kind of form. Later, an artist who transitions from illegal to legal street art, but up next, an artist who is doing everything in his power to bring art to Avalon Park in the south side of Chicago. We're back with Word on the Street, Chicago's Graffiti Renaissance. I'm Val Warner, joined by author and poet Kevin Koval. And Kevin, why do you think street art is such an important part of our community? It's one of the few art forms that intentionally tries to desegregate the city. Uh, there's a notion in graffiti of going all city, of having your art be in every neighborhood. And so artists, young artists, will traverse the city in a way that their parents might not have been able to. And so they get around. And so I think, you know, not only is it, you know, visually beautiful, but it's also everywhere. Okay, tell us about our next street artist we're gonna see. Yeah, Max Sansing, who's one of my favorite artists uh, in the world. He comes from both a graffiti background and also fine art background. Someone who is intentionally trying to represent the community on the walls of that community. And so it's part of the reason why he has so many walls on the south side of the city. All right, here's Max. I got into art at a young age. After sports didn't work out, I just kind of started doing art full time. Through high school, eventually through college, I really buckled down and really got into the whole fine art illustrative scene. Alongside and parallel through high school, I was into the graffiti scene. The two kind of just met in the middle when I got into the muralist scene and kind of just snowballed from there. Street art, murals, it's either that or blank wall, you know, the world looks like a prison. Everything's sterile. I'm Max Sansing, I'm a fine artist and muralist. I don't really want to just put up art for art's sake, or just, hey, here's my artwork, here's my Instagram. I want to be able to do purposeful pieces. I grew up on the south side, off of 79th Street in Avalon Park. I only ever lived in one place, and I love where I'm from and the people who raised me and the people who influenced me. My father, he was a painter, and his artwork came from a real honest place. Every time I see it, it makes me think 79th Street. You know, the people I knew and I grew up with, they want my artwork to do the same thing. I believe Southside gets a really bad rap, but it's just home, neighborhood, community, and just like any other place. All the things that people love and dig and compliment me for on my artwork, that comes from that. That comes from that thing that people are scared to go see and visit on the south side. When you're doing public art, 
there's a different type of responsibility I feel where it's like you're doing your work but you're putting it in a space where people live every day and the same way we kind of trip about billboards that go up in our neighborhoods and how it affects the youth it's the same thing with the art like the art can also kind of uh, either play a good part in terms of the culture that's there or a bad part. A lot of my artwork is portraiture. People can kind of see themselves in it. It's ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. The way I paint my portraits, I try not to do facial tones. I like to do just a lot of extreme colors. I paint people in red, blue, purple. I just always thought it was kind of cool just to be able to take people and put them beyond what you see every day. What if we were beyond this color, you know? Children are the future. These are the ones who inherit the neighborhood, the community. If you do them well, they do the neighborhood back well. So for kids to be able to see people that look like them in their neighborhood painted in like monumental ways, that does something to you. Culture is what lasts. Even in the community where I come from, the people who were there before, there's remnants. There's old murals, there's old advertisements. Those things are still there. We've seen in Chicago alone, wherever the culture is strong, the neighborhood is strong. And we're on the south side unveiling my newest mural along with Kayla McCaffrey's mural as well. We did these two projects alongside the Southeast Chicago Chamber of Commerce. A lot of times on the South Side, the media portrays a very negative portrayal of what the community experience is. But people who live and grow up here know a completely different story. Before we met Max, we didn't have any public murals within our boundaries. So over three miles of area and nothing to act as a cultural identifier in this community. The murals that Max creates all have a very futuristic, idealistic, empowering approach to what community can feel like. When you get to meet somebody like Max, who has been all around the world traveling and painting, and you see that he gets the most excited about doing something right where he grew up, you just become ecstatic. He will shift things that could probably pay him a lot more <laughs> and be greatly more beneficial to his fame, but because of his roots, he will make sure that his community is taken care of. Kevin, what's the difference between street art and graffiti? Graffiti is really about style writing, about manipulating the science, the mathematics, geometry of letters. And street art is putting up characters and different applications applied to the wall. Well, coming up next, you're going to meet a former illegal artist, turned legal artist, and educator and activist. He spent most of his youth creating illegal street art and getting arrested for it. Now, he is one of the most admired street artists in the country. I think it was about 2010. That was the last time I went to jail for tagging. The whole time that I was locked up, I was like, there's no way that I'm gonna ever get caught again. And I also knew that there's no way I'm ever gonna stop doing graffiti. I'm Kane One, I'm a graffiti artist in Chicago. I'm in three different crews here in the city. Crews is just our word for collectives, so we operate as strong sort of painting team and it's a great way to inspire peers, it's a great way to stay motivated, to plan out big mural productions and to pull all of our resources together to create some free public art. It used to mean something a lot different in the 90s when I joined all these crews. Things are pretty much more relaxed nowadays and everyone's just excited to be painting or to see more work up in the city. I'm still really interested in blurring the line between what's legal and illegal. I grew up in Pilsen. I've been painting here for 30 years now. I got into graffiti in high school. I met older graffiti writers in my neighborhood and just started watching people paint walls. So I would spend hours just sitting on a sidewalk watching other people paint. That's really how I learned how to do graffiti in the street. It was really looked down upon for so many years and I couldn't even talk about it as an undergrad in painting. But now I, I'm really excited about where we are, even at the city level, on the amount of support that we're starting to receive and the kinds of initiatives happening citywide. It's, it's really inspiring. 
I think there's a huge shift in the city of Chicago in the perception. It was tough as banning the sale of spray paint in 1995. And we still have that ban in order now, so you can't even buy spray paint here in the city. But from arresting people for felonies to, for spray painting to now commissioning artists with city funds for large-scale murals, it's just the huge swing in the pendulum, and it's, it's amazing to see the support now. Graffiti Institute started in 2012, and it's really like sort of my response to trying to teach graffiti and other nonprofits throughout the city. I was meeting some personal frustrations about sort of classroom parameters. And so Graffiti Institute was my sort of response and my answer to how I wanted to teach. A much smaller classroom sizes, much more fluid parameters, much more project-based. And so whenever the work was done, that's when the class ended. Understanding shifts in genres and intentions and politics in art helped me figure out what was going on politically in the world. So hopefully it's the same way that I can inspire other people to understand art as well. I'm really in for learning sort of in the long haul of things. So if I can get to know somebody in like three to five years, I feel like I can actually make an impact. King's work with the community has really inspired me to get out there and put in the time and work that it takes to be a part of each community, especially in Chicago. And I think that's been the most valuable lesson I've learned. When people see my artwork, my hope is that it kicks them out of their mundane habits. That for a moment, they ponder something else outside of whatever's going on in their daily life. Kevin, we just learned the difference between illegal and legal street art, where folks are just trying to spread positivity. Will there ever come a day where you won't get arrested and this won't be a felony? I hope so. I think it's on us to put pressure on politicians and companies who are also using graffiti for their own purposes and change the laws. I mean, right now it's a class A felony to write graffiti in the city. You can't buy spray paint. You can go to jail for a very long time. And so it's on us and all of us to kind of educate one another and get, get these laws changed. Thank you so much for watching. Kevin, thank you for taking us on a tour today. But before I let you go, I have one question to ask you. What is this word behind me? Oh, that's a good, you can't read it? No, I cannot read this. Well, this is, this is a writer in Chicago who I love very much named Amuse. Amuse. So, Amuse. You see an A? Yeah.